It's a warrior shield and the race to counteract the firepower hurtling at him. You can take a lick and keep on taking it. It's made of steel, glass, and top secret material. Able to stop a bomb and catch a bullet. It uses the layering almost like a spider web to ensnare it. The warrior's life saving defense. From the scientific compounds that protect tanks to the most advanced bulletproof vests. This thing did save my life. Now, armor on combat tech. Modern Battlefield is a gauntlet of explosive firepower. The most advanced ballistic hardware has redefined war's deadliness. But in war, there's not just offense, there's defense. The countermeasure to bombs, bullets, and missiles is armor. Today's U.S. ground forces are the most well-protected warriors in history. The armor they wear and which shields their vehicles is the product of billions of dollars in research and development. Veterans like Steve Schitterer say it's worth every penny. This is the IBA or the Interceptor Body Armor Vest that I was wearing July 2nd, 2005. This inch and a half of Kevlar and woven string saved my life. Shitterer is just one of thousands of American soldiers who can make that claim. But his experience was different because it was captured on video by the very enemy that placed him in its crosshairs. Usually they're sitting in some type of cover and concealment waiting for you to come by as a target of opportunity. On patrol in Baghdad, Shitterer has no clue that an Iraqi sniper is aiming at his heart. When it struck me in the chest, it felt like someone had just teed off with a sledgehammer right in the center of my chest. I thought I was dead. And I was like, wow, this is the last stuff I'm going to see. This sucks. But an instant later, Shitterer senses an injury may not be fatal. I was like, wait, still breathing? Well, I better get on the other side of the truck. Once I got to that safe side, I had opened my vest and realized that it never penetrated the plate. And the, what I had felt, what, what I thought was blood, was just the sweat from running around for the last three hours in the Iraqi sun. Shitterer's survival story has a twist. The sniper who shot him was wounded and captured shortly after the attack. And amazingly, he used his skills as a medic to save the attacker's life. Well, we always treat the injuries. You never worry about who it is. If it's friend or foe, everyone's treated the same. We always try to conserve our fighting strength. But when possible, make sure you're also treating the local nationals and any enemy combatants. The plate and the armored vest save both their lives. It's made of a complex ceramic compound, boron oxide with a backing made from polyethylene. The same material used to make plastic bags. Together, they form one of the hardest compounds known to science. At this time, the bullet is still in this plate. As you can tell, it's the round impacted directly above my heart. Uh, if it did not have this plate, it would have passed through and through, and I would have been dead before I hit the ground. Engineers conceived this game-changing armor by building on the legacy begun centuries earlier by their ancient counterparts. The challenge then was the same as it is now, to stay one step ahead of the weapons makers. The historic fighters answer wooden spears with wooden shields. Medieval blacksmiths counter iron swords and arrows with iron shields and garments made of interlocking iron rings called chainmail, which work well against the cutting blow, but not against the stabbing blow that can part the links. The solution to the sword is plate armor. When firearms enter the battlefield in the 1300s, armors respond by making entire suits from plate armor. By the time we get to the 1400s, they look like, you know, precursors to the modern day tank. Their entire body is armored. The vehicle on which they're riding, that is the horse, is also armored. And they, yes, are incredibly protected, but they're also almost immovable. Medieval engineers face a dilemma that challenges armors to this day, adding protection without sacrificing mobility. For centuries, armors experiment with different materials and designs. Then in 1901, a Catholic priest named Casimir Zeglin delivers a pioneering solution, the first bulletproof vest. 
and it's made of an ancient fiber that's stronger than steel, silk. Zaglin's vest is made of four one-eighth of an inch thick sheets of densely woven silk. The silk in each sheet is layered in several cross sections. When a bullet hits the vest, the first sheets of silk absorb the impact, slowing it down enough for the final sections to actually catch the bullet before it reaches the body. Best of all, an average size vest weighs less than 20 pounds. Zeglin asks a colleague to stand behind it, which he does, taking several shots to the chest at close range and surviving unharmed. By World War I, weapons makers have developed ballistic firepower that can tear Zeglin's vest to shreds. Armor designers respond with the Brewster body shield, a breastplate and headpiece made of chrome nickel steel. It protects soldiers well from low velocity artillery fragments and can stop machine gun bullets traveling 2,700 feet per second. But it weighs 40 pounds and restricts a soldier's mobility and vision so much it is impractical. During World War II, weapons makers continue to press their advantage. Firepower eclipses body armor so overwhelmingly that American infantry stop wearing it. But in the sky, air crews get some measure of protection from anti-aircraft fire with the flak jacket, made of steel plates sewn into nylon. During the Korean and Vietnam Wars, ground soldiers wear modified flak jackets. But armor's age-old dilemma of weight versus mobility makes them problematic. Yes, they could stop some projectiles coming at you, but they were incredibly heavy and bulky. Soldiers uh, who had to maneuver, that is, soldiers who were out on patrol, found them to be so much of a detriment that often they would take them off. The search continues for a revolutionary form of body armor that is bulletproof and lightweight. In the 1970s, a DuPont scientist invents the solution, not for the Pentagon, but for police officers. The answer is Kevlar, a synthetic fiber that by weight is five times as strong as steel. It's so strong and lightweight that it was originally used to replace steel belting in racing tires. Kevlar is a game changer for bulletproof vests in that it gives you stopping power, but more importantly, it's light. It allows the person to finally um, wear this sort of new version of a suit of armor, but still be relatively maneuverable in the battle space. By 1985, half of America's police patrol officers routinely wear Kevlar vests. The Pentagon takes notice, and today, Kevlar is incorporated into all the body armor of America's armed forces, including the vest that saved Steve Schitterer's life. One of the reasons why so many of our troops are surviving now, why our survivability rates measuring killed against wounded are you know, twice as high now as they were in Vietnam. Kevlar is a big part of the reason. Manufacturing the military's Kevlar vest is big business. Most of them are produced here at Point Blank Body Armor in Oakland Park, Florida. These experts are churning out an order for 30,000 vests, similar to Steve Schitterer's. The Interceptor Multi-Threat Body Armor System. It all starts with the Kevlar. When all the ballistic material has been spread, we will have spread over 625,000 yards of Kevlar material. If you equate the amount of yardage that goes on the vests that are protecting the soldiers in the field, it averages about to about 21 yards per soldier. At first glance, a sheet of Kevlar doesn't seem like a speeding bullet's worst enemy, but looks can be deceiving. If you look at this material, it's very pliable and very lightweight, but it's so thin that it in, in and of itself would not stop a bullet. But if you layer it in a certain ballistic configuration, it will. Multiple layers of Kevlar form a bullet-resistant shield in the same way as Casimir Zeglin's pioneering vest in 1901. Kevlar doesn't deflect a bullet, it absorbs it. Kevlar is designed almost to allow it to penetrate so far and then entrap it. It uses the layering almost like a spider web to ensnare it. By combining its strength with its light weight, Kevlar provides a soldier not just protection, but the crucial advantage armors of the past could not. Mobility. The Kevlar material is inserted into this cover, which is called ripstop. 
and this is one of the 13 ballistic component pieces, which is called the Growing Protector. As you can see, it's very durable, very flexible, so it allows for soldiers that are running through the field not to have a hard, rigid piece going up against their body. It kind of conforms to their body. Together, the 13 Kevlar pieces comprising the interceptor vest weigh just eight pounds. But depending on the threat level soldiers face, they can armor up the interceptor by adding ceramic plates like the one that saved Steve Schitterer. You take your ceramic plate, insert it in, so you have a plate in the front, a plate in the rear, and a plate on both sides. So this protects all your vital organs from high-powered rifle fire. To make sure its armored vests are everything they're supposed to be, Point Rifle conducts routine ballistics tests. The indentations in the clay reveal that even Kevlar can't completely eliminate trauma to the human body when a bullet strikes. The trick is to minimize the trauma to an acceptable level. So what this represents is like a big solid punch. It's gonna hurt, but you're gonna make it through it. None of the bullets fired in this test has penetrated any deeper than the fourth ply of the layered Kevlar. But as effective as Kevlar and the interceptor armor system can be, there is no guarantee that a soldier wearing it during an intense firefight will survive. As much as you are better protected by your armor, that's only where the armor is, you know, present. When you're on the battlefield, you're still incredibly vulnerable here, here, and to ordnance coming from below. So for all the progress that we've had, yeah, you've got a lot better chance of surviving, but you've still got a lot of places where your body is unprotected. One way to correct that weakness is to make sure the enemy never even sees you, because if the enemy can't see you, they can't shoot you. But that doesn't mean you can't shoot them. Body armor is the core of the warrior's defense. From steel, to Kevlar, to synthetic compounds. Body armor's strength is the key to its life-saving ability against the enemy's increasingly powerful ballistic onslaught. But body armor's greatest strength is often overlooked. Sometimes, the best armor is a good disguise. Camouflage is the science of strategic concealment. Think of it as armor by stealth. If the enemy can't see you, they can't target you. Sometimes the best armor on the battlefield is not being seen at all. If you can't be seen, then you can't be hit. In the modern military, camouflage uniforms are standard issue for soldiers on the ground. But camouflage didn't catch on in a big way until the past century. Before then, armies dressed their soldiers in bright, bold colors so their generals could see them on the battlefield. It allows the commanders to see where their units are. I'm the general trying to see through the fog of war, the smoke on the battlefield, and know that's where my grenadiers are. OK, that's where my guardsmen are. I'm identifying them in that way. By World War I, firepower had escalated so dramatically that high visibility in combat can be death sentence. Soldiers on both sides seize the initiative. They cover their positions with foliage or chicken wire stuffed with rags to help conceal their own outlines as they peek above the trenches. Some wear helmets with hand-painted schemes that blend in with the surroundings. In World War II, U.S. military planners introduced America's first camouflage uniform worn by the Marines in the Pacific. It is reversible. One side is marked with spotty blobs of green and brown to blend in with jungle settings. The other side is mostly brown to blend in on beaches. Camouflage uniforms of the next half century follow the same basic premise, which hinges on a curious contradiction that Army engineers and designers at the U.S. Army Soldier System Center in Natick, Massachusetts are working to reconcile. In order for a camouflage pattern to be effective, we need to be able to see it so that the human eye isn't being drawn to it as something that's out of place or something that doesn't belong. They're just going to see another part of nature. The idea is still the rule now. But starting in the 1990s, camouflage has gone digital. Look close and you'll see how the colored patterns are actually made up of tiny squares less than one centimeter wide. The squares create a pixelated effect. 
our eyes have a tough time dealing with these sort of fractal patterns that are out there. So we try and make sense out of these digital patterns and we sort of blend them together in a way that allows the camouflage to hide within the noise that's around it. But whether a soldier's camouflage uniform is digital or traditional, some basic elements are the same. The first is color, which to be effective has to match the multiple shades of the environment surrounding it. As you can see on these upper leaves right here, we've got a much different shade of green than the same branches and leaves a little bit lower down. You need to reflect that in the camouflage pattern with different shades of greens for this particular uniform. Camouflage also has to blend in with nature's complex variety of geometric shapes. Even on a single plant in the jungle, the leaves at the top are much thinner than those near the ground. The patterns on a camouflage uniform are generally bigger than those in the surrounding environment. So up close, a soldier's outline will still stand out. That's because camouflage is designed to work its magic best from a distance. But designing the most useful camouflage uniform is no easy chore. Since battle environments can have strikingly different looks, even in one theater of war. We have to keep in mind that our soldiers aren't necessarily fighting in one specific place. During the course of an operation, you can begin down on a riverbank, and as you progressively move through that operation, you've now maybe gone through a, an urban center. The challenge that we've been confronted with is how do we provide protection for that soldier from the beginning of his mission to the end of his mission? The Army's solution a uniform bearing what it calls a universal camouflage pattern, or UCP. With the goal of developing a single uniform from colors that can blend into several different environments, designers have to deal with a phenomenon known as metamerism, in which colors look different under various light conditions. On the Daylight 75, there's a little bit of a color difference, but they're basically the same color. When I flip to a different light source, such as incandescent, there's a tremendous flare. This one stays on the greener cast, this one flares to a redder cast. Cool white, you can also see the same, it, it shifts in the same direction. For universal camouflage, designers settle on three colors, all found in both desert and woodland environments. Gray, tan, and sage green. Determining how well any camouflage pattern works in war zones takes exhaustive testing. One of the tests that we run is basically a very sophisticated Where's Waldo. Soldiers will sit in front of the monitor, finding the target within the scene. Target is going to progressively get closer and closer and closer to the observer. We're really trying to see what works where and how well. Where camouflage uniforms are an invaluable form of protection for ground troops, no war fighter depends on camouflage more than the sniper. Just ask the sniper instructors here at Camp Pendleton, near Oceanside, California. Snipers often have to stock their targets over several days. To avoid detection, they rely on a unique type of camouflage, a ghillie suit. The sniper utilizes his ghillie suit to such a degree, um, in such a critical time, to keep him concealed from the enemy. And without it, it could ultimately mean death or loss of the mission. Since snipers have to stalk their enemy in their own backyard, their survival depends on more than just blending in. They have to become part of the surroundings. So instead of pixels and patterns, snipers fashion their disguise from the environment itself. The ghillie suit is designed to trick the human eye. It is basically there to break up that outline of the human body that the eye is so accustomed to picking up. Snipers handcraft their own suits one layer at a time. The camouflage uniform and attached to it would be some type of netting, as you can see here. After the netting has been attached, then you would strip this material, a uh, burlap sack or sandbag, and it's painstakingly gathered piece by piece until you pull it all out and you come up with a bundle. You find a bare spot and just tie it in like this. Once their baseline suit is finished, snipers refine it by adding real branches, twigs, leaves, vines, and moss, whatever helps them become indistinguishable from their surroundings. It's truly the natural vegetation that lies within that environment that would allow you to blend in so well. 
Protecting soldiers with camouflage and bullet-resistant synthetics is one thing. Shielding war machines like this demands art that's truly heavy duty. Whether a protective vest or a deceptive pattern, body armor is a soldier's last line of defense against enemy firepower. But what protects the soldiers who bring in the big guns and face the enemy's first barrage of high-tech weapons? This is the Abrams M1 tank, the most lethal tank ever produced and the most protected. Operation Iraqi Freedom, you see the tank particularly the Abrams, reaching sort of its, its full potential. We see small numbers of fast-moving forces really doing what the architects of the Blitzkrieg could only imagine. During the initial stage of Operation Iraqi Freedom, American tanks storm across the desert, taking out Iraqi tanks, vehicles, and soldiers with near impunity. The assault is led by hundreds of M1 Abrams, and in part because of its armor, not one Abrams tank member is killed by enemy fire during the invasion. To see the Abrams 70-ton protective steel shell is to see the end result of nearly 100 years of one upmanship between arms and armor manufacture. Basically what we have is uh, about a one-inch steel on the rear end, it protects our engine compartment. Uh, we can open up, kind of take a look at the thickness. Pretty thick steel right here. Uh, can pr protect us against RPG rounds, small arms rounds, 50 cal rounds. During a second tour of Iraq, Sergeant First Class Joe Lopez experiences firsthand the strength of the Abrams steel plated walls. Lopez and his crew are ordered to attack a village inside the notorious Triangle of Death as they approach. The crew is met with a barrage of mortar fire. You can feel shrapnel hitting, hitting the sides of the tank. It's not like the movies you hear, ping, ping, ping. You know, it's more of a dull sound. You're scared to a point, but uh, you have faith in your crew, in your soldiers. You have faith in your armor. No penetration was done, uh, and we kept pushing through. The M1 is a killing machine of unequaled measure. But its development was more about protective ability than destructive power. And just like all tanks before it, it owes its origins to the British War I, the world's first combat tanks to see action during World War I. So it was really designed to protect infantry soldiers. It wouldn't take too many days of sitting in a trench watching your enemies get shot up to say, you know, it sure would be nice if when I get up, I've got some metal around me. World War I tank manufacturers built tanks with enough steel to stop small arms fire. But it isn't long before arms manufacturers develop anti-tank guns with enough firepower to penetrate that steel. The tank manufacturers respond with even more steel. As the ordnance gets more powerful, uh, the defender has an impossible task. The only way you compensate is by making the tank thicker. But by continuing to pile on more steel, tank manufacturers create a problem for themselves. The tanks are slow and hard to maneuver. Tank engineers are faced with the armorer's age-old dilemma, how to find the right balance between protection and maneuverability. Just before World War II, Soviet engineers present a solution, the T-34, an innovative tank which uses the geometry of a slope design. At the start of World War II, we uh, figure out that, hold it, the angle of the armor matters. And I can have something of the same thickness, but when I give an angle, not only does it allow the trajectory potentially to zing off of it, but it has a thicker amount to go through, even though it's actually the same size. So we see the design of tanks change. The change stuck. The same slope design is used in the modern day Abrams. What we have here is the belly of the tank. It's about up to five inches thick. It can protect us against any like heavy artillery rounds or anything that may be planted in the ground IEDs. If the armor was like this, the, it'll, the round would just straight penetrate the tank. If it's like this, it'll it have to travel a little bit further distance to actually penetrate the tank. By 1940, 
German engineers introduced another game-changing weapon with some geometry of their own. The Shape Charge High Explosive Anti-Tank Warhead, or Heat Round. A heat round has a cone-shaped head that is backed by a high explosive charge. Upon detonation, the cone-shaped head collapses, forming a high-velocity molten jet which, propelled at over 1,500 miles per hour, can shoot right through a tank's steel plates. Heat rounds are so effective during World War II that they enable a single soldier to stop a tank with a bazooka or other handheld weapons. Neither American Sherman tanks nor German panzers are immune to the heat round's destructive power. But tanks have already reached a tipping point when it comes to adding more steel. So tank engineers are faced with the latest version of their old problem. This time, how to protect tanks against the heat rounds without adding more weight. In the 1960s, British researchers at the Chobham Research Center invent the solution. The response to that also is, instead of trying to have ever thicker, heavier armor, let's turn to another material to serve as armor. And that's what you get with Chobham armor. The new material is a compound of hard ceramics. Formed into tiles, the compound is layered between two steel plates. When a projectile penetrates the first layer of steel, it hits the ceramic tile, which cracks, dissipating the energy laterally and away from the tank. The second layer of steel acts as a final barrier against the remaining energy. Because the ceramic tile center reduces the amount of steel in regular armor, the Chobham armor spurs on a new era of lighter, faster tanks, like today's M1 Abrams. We get back right here, we have a, a top of armor. Open up, we can see how thick it is. It's pretty thick skirt, pretty heavy. Look right here, you can see the thickness of it. Um, this armor also, uh, if you look at the top, uh, it protects the, the front of the, the turret right here, the crew compartment up here. But Abram's designers don't stop there. They also add a layer of protection made from one of the most dense materials science has ever made depleted uranium. As we move into the atomic age, we realize, hold it, uranium or depleted uranium is even better. And also, it throws up the problem set of the person who's on the defense, who's the armor. Yeah, I could find something just as dense. I could get my own depleted uranium, except I'd have to be driving around in a tank, literally, with depleted uranium surrounding it. Instead of surrounding the entire Ames with depleted uranium, which would add thousands of pounds. Engineers encase just the most vital areas of the tank. Once we get about in this area right here, we got uh, the clear uranium skirts, which uh, is pretty thick still. It protects the, the ammunition compartment back here. Until you move down into the crew compartment inside of here, also the clear uranium. The combination of Chobham armor and depleted uranium shields the tank against projectiles, but it provides little protection against another weapon, ash an acronym for High Explosive Squash Head. HESH uses shock waves, not to go through a tank's armor, but to turn the tank's armor into becoming the weapon itself. Now we're looking at trying to use the shock wave of the munition itself to basically sort of um, literally, uh, there's no other way to put it, shake things to a point of death and danger inside. HESH warheads are thin metal shells filled with soft plastic explosives. When the plastic explosive hits a tank, it squashes against the surface of the tank, creating a wave that moves through the tank's armor. The shock energy then causes pieces of steel from the tank's interior wall to project at high velocity. Those steel particles, called spall, can then tear into anyone inside the tank. The metal will spall off on the inside and go around in the tank like a like a Cuisinart. Not a good day for the folks in the tank. Arms makers counter the spall effect with a kind of bulletproof tank vest that catches the spall. These spall liners are produced at companies like Kinetic in Franklin, Massachusetts. All right, so this is an example of a, a hard spall liner where, where we have a, a layered system or a, a set of uh, a set of different materials which will help defeat the threat of, of the requirement. 
In here we may have alumina, we may have Kevlar, we may have some sort of a fiberglass, all maybe buried in epoxy, and we put that against the inside of the vehicle. Now we're inside the turret of the tank. Around me, we've got all this thick metal, steel. In addition to that, we also have interior to this, a spot liner. Keeps the, uh, when we get impacted on the outside of the tank, keeps the inside from crumbling, fragmenting, and putting uh, fragments inside the tank for the injured crew. Today, more than 5,000 Abrams tanks in the U.S. arsenal are equipped with the best armor concepts from the past. Spall liners, chop them off, depleted uranium, and a sloped underbelly are all testament to the innovation and adaptability of past armor manufacturers. But with the military intent on becoming lighter on its feet, smaller armored vehicles are now doing more of the heavy lifting on the battlefield. And weapons builders are doing their best to stop them. March 2003. Heavily armored Abrams tanks storm across the Iraqi desert during the initial invasion of Operation Iraqi Freedom. The Abrams help push the fight into the cities, where smaller armored vehicles take the lead against the Iraqi insurgents. This is where the insurgents will make their stand. And it's here that they unleash an unconventional weapon capable of inflicting brutal destruction on both soldiers and armored vehicles alike. IEDs were the weapon of choice for the insurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan. They are easy to build and fairly easy to deploy. You can go to a remote location and when you see a convoy coming, you can detonate it on command and uh, inflict as many casualties as you possibly can. Improvised explosive devices, sophisticated homemade bombs insurgents place in the roadway to ambush U.S. forces are used to devastating effect accounting for over 60% of all American deaths in Iraq. The insurgents' main target is the Humvee, a troop carrier with a flat underbelly that proves deadly. If you have a flat bottom vehicle, it's gonna absorb a lot of the uh, explosive power. It's gonna have that uh, just directed straight into it. When a bomb explodes underneath the vehicle with a flat hull, the full force of the impact explodes straight up and into the crew compartment. Engineers at Oshkosh Defense in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, meet the challenge with a simple structural change. And they unveil it on their latest armored vehicle, the MRAP, or the Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Troop Carrier. The MRAP uses much of the same armor as the Abrams tank, including a thick steel shell and interior spall liners. But the real life-saving innovation is its E-shaped hull. When an explosion from an IED goes up, it'll hit the hull and it'll spread it out so it pushes it outward, so straight up, so the crew doesn't get any trap metal, ball bearings, anything like that that will actually harm the crew. On January 28, 2010, Master Sergeant Doug Merritt gets a first-hand demonstration of the V-shaped hull when a roadside IED explodes underneath his MRAP while on patrol in Iraq. Everything went black, huge explosion, a lot of noise, a lot of debris flying around, a lot of smoke. The bomb's force propels the MRAP several feet in the air. Still, the MRAP's V-shaped hull performs exactly as designed. The V-shaped hull helps dissipate where the explosion blows up and doesn't get it a good hit on any one portion of the vehicle. So even though it actually blew up on the fuel tank, it didn't rupture the fuel tank. The armor on that truck, I know, saved us from getting seriously injured that day. The V-shaped hull provides a level of protection from IEDs exploding from below. But it does little to shield vehicles from another tactic, RPG attacks from the sides. It's a dilemma that prompts armorers to pioneer an entirely new mindset. The thing that's new is the idea of extending the armor, of making it active. That is, a technology that doesn't wait for the enemy shell to hit it and try and penetrate it, 
but says, no, my best line of defense is pushing my defense out and making it explode before it comes close enough to cause damage. The initial solution is to add thick steel plates that protrude several inches from the vehicle's side. If you push the explosion out a little further, the amount of lethality that's essentially contained by that RPG is limited. Although it proves effective, the add-on steel is an age-old solution with a predictable result. Not only are the steel plates cumbersome, they're heavy. So armor manufacturers work toward a more lightweight solution. This is the unlikely answer. This is the Kevlar netting for our RPG defeat solution. Netting fitted with small metal nodes. These are the metal nodes which actually do the damage. They're working on fixing these to the nets, and once they're on, we've got a full and complete net, and we pack it out to, to meet up with the rest of the kit. Which is a simple metal frame, and that's it. Imagine this wrapped all the way around the vehicle. An RPG will come driving in here, and it passes through the netting, and these nodes cut into the cone. It shorts out the fuse, defeats the bomb. It hits the side of the truck, but there's no explosion, meaning that everybody inside still can drive away. At least that's how the netting works during initial tests. When units are sent to the field and assembled around MRAPs, they do not instill much confidence in the soldiers who rely on them for protection. A majority of us, myself included, were very skeptical of you know, string connected with plastic and a metal frame was going to do any good as far as stopping a, a rocket propelled grenade. For Lieutenant Matthew Ward, the real test comes in Iraq where he and his convoy are attacked as they deliver Iraqi election ballots to civilian headquarters. The trail vehicle sustained two direct hits from RPGs, uh, broadside hits. When Ward reaches the trail MRAP, its side is scorched, but not compromised. The RPG simply detonates upon impacting this net. The resulting explosion and shrapnel didn't have enough velocity to penetrate the plate armor. The netting proves a success against low-velocity RPGs. But it's useless against the latest incarnation of this groundbreaking weapon. Explosively formed penetrators, or EFPs. Insurgents place EFPs in the road, like IEDs. Or for an even more deadly effect, mount them at window level to penetrate the side of an armored vehicle. With EFPs, it's their explosive power that makes them so lethal. EFP approach is another way to make the energy of the offensive weapon so channeled that you can actually penetrate through a narrow part of the vehicle's uh, wall and then uh, get inside and go from there. An EFP is comprised of a steel cylinder that is filled with high energy plastic explosives which is sealed on top with a concave copper plate. When the EFP explodes it creates so much kinetic energy that it turns the copper plate into a metal slug that can penetrate several layers of hard steel. The vehicle's pretty much destroyed and everybody in it when you get hit by an EFP. I've seen where it's actually gone through the side of the skirt of a tank, hit the road wheels, down by the hole, and on the other side it went through. Explosively formed penetrators pose yet another problem for armor manufacturers. How to protect the side and windows of an armored vehicle from such concentrated firepower. And this time, they find the solution in counterintuitive material, glass. The notion of new technologies like glass laminate is actually interesting because it's the idea that by creating layers, your external layers can absorb the energy of the projectile and dissipate. Today, glass laminate is installed in every MRAP, making it the most armored troop transport in the U.S. military. Just as Sergeant Ramon Manzano, glass laminate armor saved his life. I'm uh, doing a mission where actually uh, we received sniper fire to my right window, and uh, actually the, uh, the ballistic glass prevented the, uh, the round from coming through. And all it did was, you know, puncture a little hole into the glass where it just spider webbed around it. When it hit the glass, it just ricocheted off of it. Made of several classified compounds and reinforced with thin wire mesh, glass laminate armor is a thicker and stronger version of bulletproof glass. 
with alternating layers of glass and polycarbonate. When a bullet hits the glass, it flattens. The second layer absorbs the bullet's energy, slowing it, if not stopping it completely. In a perfect world, because of the ballistic glass and what I've seen it withstand, you know, if they made MRAPs all glass, that would be the, the type of vehicle that I would choose. Glass laminate brings another benefit over steel armor. One of the advantages that we have with this is that we can see all around us. Uh, the, the turret has glass along with the rearview mirrors. The more things that you can see, the safer that you are. And On the modern battlefield, no force is safer or more armored than the U.S. military. But the race between arms and armor makers is far from over. With the dangers on the battlefield constantly shifting, scientists look for new materials to make armor and protect our future warriors. One of the most promising? Liquid armor. Since the beginning of warfare, arms and armor makers have been locked in a centuries-old fight for control of the battlefield. From the advanced materials and basic geometry that shape America's tanks and aircrafts, to the life-saving body armor that protects our ground troops, the U.S. military is an integrated force that is only as strong as its weakest link, as it has been throughout history. One of the interesting things in the history of war is there's always this back and forth, an arms race, so to speak, between the weapon and the armor, the defense against that weapon. And it's everything from, you know, the first spear to then we get leather and then bronze to plate mail to chain mail. And we see the same thing in terms of vehicles. Um, initially, when you see, you know, mobility in the battle space, it's horses and then it's vehicles and then hold it. Can you just keep adding armor? No, mobility, it's the speed of the tank that matters. And so the point being is we've always had this back and forth and that continues today. So the military continues to look for the holy grail, armor that provides total protection while leaving soldiers and vehicles completely unencumbered. I, I do think that just everything we've seen about the ability to direct explosive or other uh, energy into a more concentrated beam does suggest that the defense is going to have a hard time keeping up over the decades and that the way you win in warfare increasingly is to get in the first shot. In future wars, the first shot is certain to be the most destructive ever. As enemies adapt new firepower and techniques, armor manufacturers must protect against the next war's equivalent to IEDs and explosively formed penetrators. So what is on the horizon? Initially, armor was something um, where its thickness mattered most. And then we get into figuring out layering and new materials. And now we're getting the idea of armor that could even be liquid. One potential way to apply liquid armor is as a full body suit filled with tiny iron particles that are suspended in silicon oil. The suit is wired with an electrical current, which is controlled by an onboard computer system. When a ballistic threat hits the suit, the computer automatically applies an electrical charge, which in milliseconds locks the iron particles together, creating an impenetrable shield. Once the charge is removed, the particles unlock, and the substance goes back to a fluid state. Could liquid armor signal the end to the seemingly endless race between arms manufacturers and armors. When I look back at the history of war to our most futuristic science fiction visions of war in galaxies far, far away and centuries all the year forward, it's still there's sort of a basic notion of um, action reaction, weapon armor. I think there'll be a healthy competition for many decades to come. For now, American soldiers enter battle as part of the most armored force ever assembled. And many of our warriors can attest firsthand the life-saving innovations behind the armor that protects them. And as long as wars continue, arms and armor manufacturers will be pitted in a deadly competition to see who can stay.